All right, well, in, uh, chapter five is devoted to the integumentary system, and there's not a lot to talk about in regard to this system, but, but we'll hit on a few high points that go with this. So bear in mind when we say the integumentary system, you know, when we say integument, we're referring to skin. All right. Now, you know, a couple of fun facts that people always like to talk about. I mean, skin is the largest organ of the human body. And remember, by definition, an organ is a structure that is composed of two or more tissues. All right. And as you're going to see here in a little bit, when I start showing you images of the skin, there are lots of different tissues and structures within the skin that make it a quite a diverse organ of the human body. All right. Now, the, the skin is also, you know, because it is diverse in, the, in, in its tissue composition, it's also diverse in its functions, all right? But if there's one primary function of skin that you definitely need to know is that skin is a physical barrier, all right? Skin is a physical barrier um, against a couple of things. We would say, one, skin retards water loss. Okay, meaning skin hinders water loss. Now, a lot of people start, a lot of people like to make the mistake of saying skin prevents water loss, but bear in mind that we sweat in order to, to thermoregulate ourselves, and obviously that's water that's being lost from the body, okay? So that's a controlled water loss. So skin doesn't prevent it, it just hinders it, all right? And then skin is a physical barrier against pathogens, okay? Basically anything that can make us sick. All right, there's a lot of stuff outside of our bodies in the world that can potentially get into us and kill us, and skin does a very good job of protecting us. Now, skin has two ways of protecting us against pathogens. One is just the physical presence of skin. All right, being that we have this layer of epithelial tissue outside of, a, you know, outside of all the other structures of our body, that acts as more or less just a, a physical wall or physical barrier that prevents bacteria, fungi, other organisms just from getting in. Okay, the other barrier that skin has is it's a chemical barrier, okay, because you have what's called, you know, on your skin, there's something called the flora, okay, I mean, not just our skin, but our body. When you see the word flora, you should think bacteria, Okay, we've got bacteria all over us, all right? We've got bacteria coating our skin. We've got a lot of bacteria in your gut, i.e. your colon, your large intestine, all right? And those bacteria do serve, serve us well, all right? The bacteria on your skin are like any other living cellular creature. They have metabolisms, and as a result, they produce wastes, all right? So they secrete a lot of wastes onto our skin, so our skin tends to have a low pH. It has an acidic pH somewhere around about the pH of 4 to 5, Okay, and that pH is conducive to the bacteria that normally populate our skin, which are harmless to us, and that also prevents other harmful organisms, you know, like other bacteria or fungi, from uh, damaging our skin as well. All right, so, so bear in mind, those are the ways that skin protects us. All right, skin plays a role in thermal regulation, temperature regulation. All right, so basically the, you know, in the, the skin works with the nervous system to help us control temperature by sweat. All right, you know, sweat and also blood. All right, so basically by just alone, by increasing blood flow to the skin, that's heat that can just radiate all right, out of our bodies and you know, just out of our bodies and out to the world. All right, but a more, I don't know, say more, but a better way of doing this is by creating sweat. Remember, water has a high heat capacity. And we say, and that's how we, you know, we circulate water around blood around our body to keep us alive, all right, to keep our temperatures in normal so our metabolism can function. But if we get too hot, we need to eliminate that excess heat, all right, and we can't radiate enough out, you know, to keep us going. So what we do is we excrete the water out via sweat, and then the heat is trapped in the water. But now just getting that water on your skin isn't good enough, okay? You have to make sure that that sweat is dripping off or uh, off of your body or evaporating off of your body. So the water has to get off of your skin in order to truly cool you, all right? And that's why it's dangerous to exercise, for example, in a really humid environment outside. You need to make sure you're very well hydrated because if you don't, um, you know, the air is going, let's say you're at a, you know, let's say the air is at 99% saturation, meaning that, you know, the humidity is at 99%. 
all right and you're out and you're out doing you know heavy yard work or exercising and you're sweating all right it's going to be very difficult for that water to evaporate off your body and therefore that sweat's going to remain on your skin and remember that water is warm and that could end up causing you to overheat that's why you need to be very properly hydrated and if you're inexperienced don't work out outside during the middle of the day on a hot humid day save it for either early morning or at night all right so um so that's basically with skin uh skin uh, helps us with temperature regulation cutaneous sensation now that's a word that now whenever you see the word cutaneous you should just automatically think skin okay because you know our bodies have different membranes you know there are synovial membranes uh membranes that that are found within the complex joints of the body there are mucous membranes membranes that are found in areas where the uh, the internal aspects of the body open up to the outside of the world like your eyes your anus your reproductive your urethra um you know your mouth your nose your ears uh, okay so and then there are cutaneous membranes i.e your skin okay so whenever you see the word cutaneous you should think skin all right and there are nerves that are there are nerve receptors uh, that are in your skin that are sensitive to touch basically sensitive to pressure all right, these are essentially pressure receptors. All right, and they're sent, and they're found in different locations of the skin. You know, the the receptors that are found higher up within the skin, you know, are going to be more sensitive. You know, that's when you're going to sense light touch. And then the receptors that are found much deeper in the deep layers of the skin are where you're going to are going to be used to detect more the the, the harder touch and pressure okay so the nervous system you know this is where we have uh, you know cutaneous sensation the sensation of touch okay there's some metabolic aspects to skin and one of the things about skin when we say metabolic is this is where vitamin D synthesis begins okay and so basically there so basically vitamin D um, you know we use it in the in the form of a hormone um, called calcitriol okay and essentially it starts out as what's called a pro hormone or like a precursor to a hormone all right so what happens is you have this this precursor sitting in your skin and it's inactive but then sunlight the energy from the, the radiation the energy from the sun comes in contact and hits that 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 precursor and it's that energy from that sunlight is going to rearrange its chemical makeup and then it's going to start circulating through the blood and then it'll start going through its, a chain reaction of chemical reactions where it'll eventually be converted into this active form of vitamin d that we call calcitriol which which makes it easier for us to um, absorb vitamin d into our system which you know is important for your bones all right so essentially we can you know so that's really the, the big metabolic aspect of skin all right um you know a blood reservoir i mean typically i mean about give or take about five percent of your blood volume is found within your skin all right and that's important for thermal you know for thermal reasons and also just to keep your skin um you know all the cells of your skin alive you have to remember your skin is the largest organ of the human body so it is going to need a you know a, a good amount of blood all right and then a big one is excretion all right you know we mentioned the excretion of water you know sweat to help cool us but we can but you know this could this would also work concomitantly with metabolic functions um, we can excrete some metabolic waste products as well because you have to remember what sweat is sweat comes from plasma all right sweat comes from you know which is about 55 percent of your blood you know the plasma of your blood is essentially just water and there are uh, there's just a bunch of stuff mixed in your water okay such as electrolytes sugars amino acids meta you know metabolic waste products okay and when you're filtering the plasma of your blood to get rid of water you're also going to filter out okay the the small substances that are dissolved in the plasma all right that's why for example let's say you go out and exercise and you wear a black hat or a black t-shirt okay black shorts or heck all the above all right and let's say you exercise for a while let's say you don't wash your shirt you know as often as you probably should then what's going to happen is you'll notice you'll see you, you see this even on your skin after one bout of exercise or on your clothing where you, it'll look like there are these whitish colored streaks on your skin or your clothes all right and what that is those are the salts that you are sweating out um you know that you're sweating out that, that were originally in your bloodstream okay you know primarily sodium 
Okay, so we can, so skin can be used for excretion as well. And these are, you know, again, the main functions of skin. But like I said, the big one that you have to remember the, the, that skin is primarily designed for is that it's a physical barrier. Okay, it, it is, it, in general, it's just a barrier to protect us from the outside world. All right. So now when we want to take a look at skin, you know, a big, you know, a big part of the, 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 this talk in this chapter is just on basically the histology, the makeup of skin, all right? And the skin is broken down into three specific regions, all right? The epidermis, the dermis, and the hypodermis, all right? The epidermis is the, is the most superficial region, the outermost region of skin. The dermis is the middle region of skin and also is the thickest region. And then the hypodermis... You know, technically, I mean, we talk about it as a layer of skin. I guess technically it's not really a part of skin. But, but what it really is, it's a combination of what's called superficial fascia and adipose tissue. Okay. Adipose tissue, what we call subcutaneous fat. All right. Um, and I'm going to talk about these layers individually as I go. All right. So bear in mind, from top to bottom, it goes epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. All right. So on that note, let's talk about the layers of the skin. And as you see, and as you take a look at, as you take a look here, you can see the layers. All right. So here would be the epidermis, because remember, you know, epi means above. Okay, and the word root dermat that means skin itself so we're saying this is you know the upper portion of skin okay and then dermis the again this is the middle layer this is the you know the skin itself and then hypodermis remember hypo means low or below all right and so as you can see here that again you can see the epidermis the outer layer of the skin um, then the dermis where there's this the dermis is obviously as you can see the busiest part of skin and then the hypodermis now the subcutaneous fat okay this is our primary as i mentioned in the last chapter in, in histology when i was talking about adipose tissue um, we mentioned that adipose tissue is our main is is our main uh calorie storage area or the where we primarily store energy, you know, in the form of triglycerides and fat, um, and then plus, you know, we use it for cushioning, thermal insulation. All right, and this is where the bulk of this adipose tissue is going to be located within the body. All right, is subcutaneously underneath the skin. All right, and that's why, you know, for example, if you want to have a, you know, if you want to have your body composition tested, you know, whether it's for basic research purposes or health purposes, one of the common tests they do are those skinfold measurements, or what people like to call them pinch tests. Okay. Okay, where you where you pinch off a layer of where you pinch off a certain area of skin, and then you take a caliper and measure it. You measure the thickness of that area, and you do it on various sites where we tend to store um, different amounts of fat. And then you run it through a calculation. Then you can come up with your the percentage of your body composition that is fat. Okay. And, you know, again, trying to keep that number lower is obviously, you know, better for health purposes. All right. So these are the three layers of the skin, and in a, in a, in a common abbreviation that you're going to see going with this too, sub, okay, sub Q, you know, like a subcutaneous injection, all right. So on that note, let's kind of work our way into and start talking about the different layers of skin. First, let's talk about the epidermis, okay? And remember, as I mentioned in the chapter devoted to histology, the epidermis is uh, composed of stratified, squamous, keratinized epithelial tissue. Okay, it's epithelial tissue. Remember, tightly packed cells. All right. Now, stratified squamous keratinized epithelial tissue. All right. So, now when we take a look at the epidermis, the epidermis is broken down into different layers. Okay. And there's one type of cell that makes up the bulk of the epidermis, and that's called a keratinocyte. Okay, keratinocyte. There are other cells in, in, in your epidermis as well. You know, you've got stem cells. All right, there are melanocytes. All right, there are phagocytes. Okay, there are what are called 
tactile cells. These are pressure receptors. Okay, these are all cells that are located within the epidermis. All right. Now, the bulk of these cells, um, you know, besides keratinocytes, are located down within the lowest layer called the stratum basale. And I'm going to talk about that a little, a little more in a little while. All right. And then, you know, okay. So now if we kind of move our way over to the next image here, this kind of gives a little bit of an appreciation for this as well. Now, when we look at the epidermis, okay, again, this would be the epidermis. This would be the dermis. And then down here, you can see the adipose, the adipose tissue. So hypodermis. All right. Now, what you, what you look at here, this looks kind of cool. Now, you see this, this sheet of cells on the top here. You see this sheet of, probably shouldn't use a color, it's the same here. So you see this sheet of cells on the top. All of those cells you see on the top, these are all dead. Okay, and they're dead keratinocytes. All right, now I'm going to talk about the life cycle of a keratinocyte in a little bit. Okay, now remember that the epidermis, it being an epithelial tissue, is always going to be grounded to a basement membrane. Okay, it's going to be ground to a basement membrane. All right, and which you can see, you know, along these ridges and dermal papillae, okay, all along, you know, the, the length of the epidermis. These papillae right here, these are areas where the dermis pushes up into the epidermis and creates these these unique looking ridges that are within skin and basically that's what fingerprints are okay areas where the dermis protrudes up into the epidermis and then like i said you form these unique imprints on your skin okay um or i mean fingertips and toes and stuff like that so now, um, what else am I going to say about that? So remember, and then always remember, directly underneath the basement membrane, there is that loose connective tissue, that connective tissue proper. And remember that the, the connective tissue that's always underneath epithelial tissue is a realer connective tissue, all right? That, uh, that very, very widely spaced, widely distributed uh, tissue. And so basically, as you saw in the image earlier, there's a lot of blood vessels, there's glands, okay? There's nerves. There's a lot going on in the dermis, okay? So the epidermis gets its oxygen and, it's, and basically its nutrient supply from the dermis, all right? So, and... and now, so then the question you should be asking yourself then is, well, why are these cells dead up here? All right, and that kind of leads me into the next topic I want to talk about, the life cycle of a keratinocyte. Okay, now before I start talking about that, I just want to mention, you know, kind of the, the other cells that you find within here as well. Okay, within the epidermis. So first, right here, you see this is a tactile cell. Or it's often called a Merkel cell. Okay. Now these are again our 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 um, receptors that we use for touch. You know, being that these are very high up within skin, these are more for light touch. Okay, because it, it's not going to take as much pressure to be transferred down through the skin to excite this nerve receptor. All right. And then as you can see here, this re this this specific cell is associated with the nerve itself. So when something touches your skin lightly enough, but with enough pressure that will stimulate this, this uh, cell, and then that will excite this nerve, and then you'll start sending impulses to your brain, and then you can say, oh, well, there's something touching my skin. All right, so that's what those tactile cells are used for. Um, and, you know, then when, we, then when we look at these combined together, this is what we call a tactile disc, okay, or a Merkel disc. All right, now as we take a look in here as well, you can, there are cells that are called melanocytes. Okay, melanocytes, well, in medical terminology, melano means black. And remember, cyto in terminology means cell, okay? So essentially what these cells do, these produce a pigment called, which you've all probably heard of at some point in time, melanin. Okay, melanin is a black colored pigment okay i'm going to talk about skin coloration in a little bit but these cells help uh, basically produce and secrete this this pigment out into the extracellular spaces and this pigment basically is a protein all right and this protein melanin what it's designed to do is absorb energy from the sun and to prevent damage to the skin 
All right. And obviously there are certain, you know, depending on what area of the world you either directly came from or, or a descendant from, have more melanin in your skin than others. But like I said, I'm going to talk more about skin coloration in a little bit. So you've got melanocytes down here. All right. And then, the, and then you can see that there are also cells um, in here, and these are the phagocytes. All right, those are the phagocytes, and um, that's what we would call basically the longer Han cells. All right, so ba basically these are white blood cells that migrated from the bloodstream into skin. All right, and basically there are, and we would, you know, they're called monocytes in the blood. All right, they look something like this. They're a cell, then they have a nucleus that looks like a big horseshoe. All right, and then once they migrate into specific tissues, then they adapt to the environment that they're within. So you'll notice that you've got this phagocyte here with all the with these long branches, all right. And basically, this is designed to protect us from. Well, I mean, it's it's a phagocyte. It helps protect us from tissue damage. You know, it eats up the debris and anything that that you know. If you if you get a break in your skin and bacteria come in, that will help you know protect us from those as well by phagocytizing, eating them, and killing them. All right, so those are some of the cells that you'll see within the epidermis, but the most abundant one that you'll see, type of cell that you'll see, is called a keratinocyte. All right, and these keratinocytes have a specific life cycle to them, which is kind of cool. All right, now, one thing to bear in mind is that the epidermis itself is divided into different layers or different regions. All right, now I'm going to talk about these from the bottom up. All right, from the bottom up. All right. Now, the lowest region of the epidermis, the, the lowest area of cells, is called the stratum basale. Okay. Now, when we say strata, okay, so the epidermis is, is, is divided into various strata. We're just talking layers. All right. Now, the stratum basale is, you know, think of basale as, you know, I think of that as base. Okay, base, basement. Okay, that's the base of the epidermis. All right, now this is by far the most active area of the epidermis. Okay, all those cells I just listed, okay, the, you know, these tactile cells, these melanocytes, you know, there are stem cells down here. Okay, these are, these are stem cells that are very, very active. Okay, they're constantly dividing and forming new keratinocytes all the time. All right, um, they may they may be dividing to form more melanocytes. If you get a sunburn and you need to protect yourself from the sun, sun, the sun, you may need to protect yourself by producing more pigment. All right, so basically, all those cells are located within the basal layer. All right, they're located right down by the um, you know by the basement membrane where the source of oxygen is. All right, so like I said, the stratum basale is the most active area of the epidermis, and you know, and the, and the stratum basale is only one cell layer thick. Okay, so now what you can see here, you know, these keratinocytes, these functional cells of skin. What happens with these is, you know, we're dividing and making new ones all the time, and then what happens with these old ones as we make new ones? The old ones are pushed up and away. Okay, and then as the old ones get farther away from the basement membrane, you can see some distinct morphologic changes in these cells. All right, these cells basically are slowly getting, they're, they're getting pushed farther away from the, their oxygen and their source of nutrients, so they're essentially slowly dying, and you're looking at the basically the, the death changes that occur within these cells. All right. And that's what that's basically why we're talking about the life cycle of a keratinocyte because you know because this it's important to understand this because this is how we develop that physical barrier to one prevent the organ pathogens from getting in and two we'll talk about how um, you know the skin helps control or you know control water loss and hinder water loss all right so the stratum basale an area of an area of mito mitosis where the bulk of the cells of the epidermis are located all right. And then next is what's called the stratum lucidum, all right, the stratum lucidum, and this is by far a very large area, all right. Okay, the stratum lucidum. Now, the stratum lucidum, all this is, it's just several, several layers of keratinocytes. It's several layers of keratinocytes, okay. Now, 
These keratinocytes, they are getting pushed farther away from the basement membrane, but they're not too far away, so they can still stay alive. All right, these cells are living, they're just doing what cells do, cranking out proteins, you know, doing their thing. Okay, but, you know, down in the base layer, we're, con we're, we're constantly producing new keratinocytes. So the old ones are getting pushed up farther and farther and farther through the um, stratum lucidum. And then eventually, what's going to happen is the cells are going to get pushed into an area called the stratum granulosum. The stratum granulosum, okay, and this is where you really start to see some changes take place. Now, within the stratum granulosum, the cell death is starting to occur, all right? Basically, um, you know, cellular inclusions and aspects of the cytoskeleton and organelles are starting to die and condense, and the cells are going to take on a different appearance and a different color as a result. What you're looking at is the beginning of the formation of keratin. All right, and also the cells in this layer, they're going to be secreting glycolipids into the extracellular matrix, and the glycolipids within this layer, okay, are basically the water barrier. Okay, so bear in mind that, you remember, what, what do you remember about fats and water? They don't get along, okay, Hy you know, hydrophobic. Lipids are hydrophobic. Okay, so essentially what this is, this barrier along the skin, this granulosum with all those with all these glycolipids in the area, prevent water, you know, from these tissue spaces of, of, of underneath of the stratum of the thick stratum lucidum and basale to leak up and out of the skin. Okay, so basically the stratum granulosum helps contain water within the epidermis. All right. And also, I mean, prevents excess water from coming in as well. Now and that's important because, for example, if someone has a third degree burn, okay, and you burn right through all layers of the, you know, of the epidermis and the skin, all right, you're, you're losing lots of water, out of, obviously out of more than just here, okay, but that's, you know, but that's big. So that's a stratum granulosum, all right. And then next, you know, depending on what area of skin you're, you're talking about and look at, looking at, um, there is an area of skin, of skin called the stratum lucidum okay but you only see this in areas where skin is very thick okay you only see this in areas of skin that's very very thick okay and again all this is is just a very very small layer of dying keratinocytes okay so you're not you're not going to see the stratum lucidum in all areas but the next part is the stratum corneum okay the stratum corneum the outer uppermost layer of the epidermis Okay, now the stratum corneum, this is basically where the keratinocytes are dead. Okay, the keratinocytes are dead in this area. Okay, and, as, and then these keratinocytes are dead. There are many, many layers of them. I mean, there could be, you know, upwards of, you know, 30 layers of dead cells here, and all these cells just pile right on top of each other, and all these dead cells are packed with the protein keratin, all right? Then that's what makes that really, really tough, you know, outer aspect of the epidermis, all right? And that's what prevents, you know, that's what prevents a mosquito from landing on you and sinking into your skin because of that, that, that those tough, hard cells out there, all right? And then eventually, these, you know, the cells are going to continue and continue and continue to get pushed upwards, and then they're eventually going to flake off. They're going to exfoliate off of off of you all right and then they're basically you know they exfoliate and then this process just is a continuous process okay about every two to three weeks all right you essentially have brand new skin okay meaning it takes about two to three weeks for a keratinocyte to begin down in the stratum basale and then work its way all the way up and then exfoliate off okay and again, that's basically how the barriers of skin are created. All right, you know, starts it basically is because of this life cycle of a keratinocyte. Okay, remember, as these cells get pushed farther away from the base of the membrane, and they start to die, and then they start to secrete these lipids. That's where you get the, you know, that's where you get the water barrier, and then the physical barrier against pathogens produced. Okay, so those are the cellular changes you see in keratinocytes as they work their way up through the epidermis. All right, and then next, when you take a look at the dermis of the skin, the middle layer, um, you know, again, this is by far the thickest area, and it could be upwards of, you know, of six millimeters in thickness, okay, in certain areas of the body, all right? 
Now, the dermis is a busy area. Okay, the dermis is primarily composed of two tissues. Areolar, connective tissue, and reticular connective tissue. All right. Typically, you're going to find most of the reticular connective tissue in the lower aspect of the dermis, and the bulk of the connective tissue is going to be the areolar in the upper aspects. Okay. But regardless, remember we said that these two connective tissues are very widely spaced, very more or less unorganized tissues. All right. And so as a result, that allows for room for other structures to populate an area where you find these tissues. All right. For example, you know, you can see blood vessels in here. You can see the blood vessels that supply, excuse me, supply the epidermis with blood. You can see hairs. You can see nerves that are associated with hairs in here. There are these muscles called piloerector muscles. Okay, you can see that there are sebaceous glands associated with the hairs, that there are sweat glands, that there are, the, that there are these, uh, you know, that there are, you know, recept receptors in the skin. I mean, there's lots you can see going on here. Okay, and that's as a result of the loose arrangement of the dermis itself. Okay, and I'm going to kind of spend some time talking about the different, you know, some of the different structures that you find here within the skin. And then, you know, or within the dermis, I'm sorry, I should say. And then basically, you know, down here again, you've got the hypodermis. I don't really feel like talking about that anymore. And again, all it is is just a layer of subcutaneous fat that has some blood vessels and some superficial fascia. Okay, but let's talk about that fascia a little bit, that connective tissue. All right, now that super, that fascia, that connective tissue, you know, it's like any other tissue, it's very sticky. All right, and that's basically how skin and muscles and fat are all anchored together. Okay, and this is important in certain areas of the body, for example, like your face. All right, you know, that, that, you know we, that's how skin can be used for communication. So let's say you want to smile and you contract the muscles in your face that need to smile. Remember, when a muscle contracts, it shortens, all right? The, so the shape of that muscle is going to change, all right? And then as a result, you're going to be pulling on your skin and, you know, where, where those muscles are contracting in a certain fashion, and you're going to contort your skin to make it look like you're smiling. Okay, if you're right now, if you look at your forearm and you look at the dorsal aspect of your forearm and you wriggle your fingers, you can see your extensor muscles wriggling around in there. Okay, again, just because of the superficial fascia and the muscles that are closely related to the skin. Okay, so that fascia helps to anchor basically all of skin to your muscles as well. All right, and then, you know, with skin color, okay, basically there are a couple of pigments that influence skin color. The main one is melanin, okay? Now, melanin really in its purest form is very black, okay? Melanin is very, very black, all right? And, but obviously not every single person on the, on the planet is jet black in color, okay? There are some people that are very white. There are some people that are, have a yellowish tinge to their skin. There are some people that are black. All right, and basically, like I said, that just depends on, you know, what geographic location you came from, okay? And the yellowish tinge in your skin comes from carotene, okay? Carotene, and then, you know, the reddish tinge in your skin comes from the presence of hemoglobin, okay? Hemoglobin, which is basically, remember, we said that um, skin, you know, about 5% of your blood volume I'm just going to abbreviate this. Blood volume is located within your skin. All right, so that's so that's where there is a little bit of a pinkish color there. All right, so basically, people that come from areas of the world that are closer to the equator are going to have more melanin in their skin. Okay, and the reason why is because of the higher exposure to sunlight, okay, the, to UV radiation. You have to remember that radiation, that energy from the sun is enough, you know, is, is energy that could potentially damage the cells in your skin. So let's say you're a person of a, a lighter or paler complexion where you have less melanin, okay, let's say you go outside and you want to tan, okay, essentially what you're doing is your, that radiation from the sun, okay, is causing damage to the cells of your skin, I mean, especially the epidermis, okay? So then what you're going to do is, remember those stem cells that we talked about, okay? Those are going to proliferate to form more melanocytes, okay? And also the current melanocytes that are already there are going to become more active. So then what you're going to do is you're going to increase melanin production, okay? 
Okay. Now, first, when you when you do this tanning process, you get burnt, you get red. Okay. Now, remember, you just did, you know you expose yourself to radiation energy that damaged your skin. Okay. Wherever there's damage, there's going to be inflammation. Okay. And where and where there's inflammation, there's going to be increased blood flow. Okay. Hence the um, the redness of your skin, and it's going to hurt because you know as you'll learn about inflammation much later on. Um, you know, part of inflammation is making your pain receptors more sensitive, okay? And then once that redness goes away and your melanin production increased, now you developed a tan. You increased, a ba basically just increased a, a, a biologic barrier to the to radiation from the sun, all right? And then once wintertime rolls around and you spend more time indoors and not as much time exposing yourself to the sun, you don't need to be wasting energy producing more melanin, okay? And that's why the tan goes away. And that's why people from parts of the world that are up farther north, you know, the Scandinavian regions of the world or the UK where they just don't see as much sun tend to have a paler complexion because they're, you're, physiologically you're not going to waste energy producing a pigment you don't need. Okay, I mean, you'll produce it, but you don't need to produce it in massive amounts like folks that come from equatorial parts of the world. Okay, so... That's essentially where skin coloration comes from, and you know the the red you know so melanin is, is again is a pigment that's used to protect yourself from the sun. Hemoglobin it's it's going to be there, and like I said, if you have skin damage, uh, you'll increase blood flow to the area. You know, like if you get a cut and it's red around the cut, or even if uh, it could be an emotional state. You know, you could just be embarrassed as all heck, and your head turns red. Or if you have a you play sports and you have a coach that yells a lot. You know, I, I remember you know if you have a bald coach that yells a lot and his whole head turns red, it looks really cool. Um, but you know, it could be any increased blood flow to a skin for an emotional state. Okay. And then, like I said, the carotene that's there will kind of take away from some of the blackness of melanin, okay? And so that's essentially skin coloration. Um, and then basically there are appendages that are associated with the skin that you find within the... Um, you know, you know, within the dermis and epidermis, you know, we've got sweat glands, oil glands, hairs, and nails. Okay. Now, essentially nails, I'm not really going to talk a ton about nails, but all nails really are is they're just, they're, they're very similar to hairs. Okay. Hairs essentially, um, Hairs essentially are just clusters of keratinocytes that, you know, that, that grow out of your skin. Okay, and the nails are you know, developed in a very similar fashion. Okay, and nails would be the human equivalent to having claws. Okay, so I mean, basically that's all nails really are. And then when you look underneath your nails, it looks really pink because there's a lot of capillary beds under there. And what's important about that is, you know, if you're in a hypoxic state where you don't have enough oxygen in your system, your nail beds are going to turn blue really fast. Okay, same thing with your lips because there's a lot of superficial blood vessels in that area. All right, and that's really about all I really want to talk about with nails. Um, but as we kind of work our way through here, you know, let's talk about the glands that are associated with skin. Okay, there are... Um, so basically when we're talking about these glands that are associated with skin, um, you know, there are a couple of different types of glands, like eccrine glands primarily secrete water, okay, which you find on the palms of your hands, your forehead, and the soles of your feet. Okay, so, there's, so their secretions are about 99% water, and there's, again, there's other solutes mixed in there. Remember, there are salts, you know, and wastes metabolic wastes that are mixed in here as well, all right, and, and remember the main purpose of these glands are thermal regulation. Okay, thermal regulation. Remember, we, you know, we increase sweat production to get body temperature down, all right? And then we've also, you know, then we can split some uh, sweat glands up uh, into apocrine glands. Basically, these are glands that you find highly concentrated um, 
within the pubic and axillary regions. And there's a little bit, there's typically more than just water coming out. There are also maybe may some fatty secretions that come out of here as well because the secretions that come out, you know, because it stinks sometimes when you, you know, when you sweat in the pubic and axillary regions. Okay, and that could be, you know, for the purpose of, you know, warding or you got to remember we're animals. So that could be for the purpose of warding a predator off, um, you know, attracting a mate, whatever it may be. Okay. And, you know, bear in mind as well as I'm talking about these glands, that these glands are also exocrine glands. These are derivative of epithelial cells or epithelial tissues. So basically when we develop these glands, remember basically what happens is you have these epithelial, these sheets of epithelial tissue, and then they start to pouch downward. And then as a result, they, you know, so you see it. So what you see is a downgrowth of the current epithelial tissues and that's why they have ducts and then they produce then the cells in here produce their secretions and then they travel on out okay and then there are also glands that are called sebaceous glands that are associated um, with hairs okay sebaceous glands are very important okay um, you know as they develop from hair follicles what they do is they secrete oil um, onto the hair follicles I'll show you some histology images of these in a sec and these sebaceous glands they, they, they release their secretions onto to the hairs and what they tend to do is basically keep your skin more moist okay and the secretions that come from these are called sebum okay it's called sebum okay and these oily secretions like I said they travel up the hairs onto your skin and again keep them keep the skin moist and lubricated which prevents it from cracking you know uh, so it keeps your you know your skin your lips um, you know all areas uh, dry or uh, moist. Now there are also um, antibodies in these secretions. You know, not just in the the, the uh, you know the the thermoregulatory sweat glands, but in the sebaceous glands that help uh, prevent you from bacterial infections as well. Okay, so that's another important aspect of this is that they help. Um, uh, you know, they help. You know, they help protect us from uh, invaders. Okay. So keep that in mind. That's really what these sebaceous glands do. And um, so you can see right here, so you can see this would be a, a hair follicle, and then this would be a sebaceous gland. So like I said, their secretions are going to travel right along the hair, work its way up, okay? work its way up the hair and onto the surface of the skin to keep it moist okay in some animals you know this may be for communication purposes as well you know they like to think that um you know that there are that, that there may be some messages with, within these sebaceous glands and they, they travel up to your hairs and then off for communication like for example when you um you know, for example, when you have a bunch of females living under one roof for a long time and their menstrual cycles, all of a sudden, you know, their monthly cycles, I should say, all are in sync with one another. Okay, maybe because of the chemical communication that's associated with these glands. Okay, that are in, and these glands are primarily concentrated, you know, in areas where there are very thick tufts of hair, you know, like your, you know, like your pubic and axillary regions of the body. Um... You know, and think about this for a second. You know, think about other animals that may utilize these sebaceous glands. Uh, let's say a dog. Okay, there is. A, it may look funny, but there's a reason why dogs sniff each other's butts. Okay, that's you know they're not doing it because they're weird. They're doing it because that's how they get to know each other. Okay, there's a high concentration of these glands in the you know in the in the in the pubic region of these dogs. So as a result, they're putting their nose in there and they're getting to know you. Okay, same thing with a dog when it for when you when it first gets to when it first meets you. Okay, where's the first place a dog is going to stick its nose? Right in your crotch. Okay, right in your reproductive area. Okay, and it's doing that again because of the high concentration of these glands. All right, and it's sniffing you. It's getting to know you. It's how it that's how it identifies you. Okay, so yeah, they're not I mean, they're not doing it just to be rude, but they're doing it because that's how they identify you. Okay, because obviously dogs not tall enough to get up to your armpits. All right, and I mean, thank goodness humans don't have to do that to get to know each other as well. I'm content with a simple handshake. So, um, you know, so that's the sebaceous glands, these oil secreting glands that are associated with hairs. Um, 
And here's another image right here. I really like this picture. So you can see basically the sebaceous gland is an outgrowth of the um, basically it's an outgrowth of the sheath around a hair. And then you can see the cells, the epithelial cells within this gland that produce their oily secretions. Okay. Now this is an area as well where infections may take place. Okay. Because, you know, sometimes bacteria may migrate down into here and they may, uh, you know, try to make a home out of this area. And it's a very good home. Okay, because remember, these secretions are very oily. Okay, and as a result, the, the what, what's going to happen then is the bacteria are going to start to, they're going to want to stay here. It's dark, it's damp, it's away from the bulk of your immune system. I said there are some antibodies and stuff in here, but I mean, but you know, the bacteria can get around those. Okay, so basically it's got a great food source and it's away from your immune system. That's a great area to grow. And then this gland may become swollen and inflamed and then you develop what's called a sebaceous cyst. Okay, now moral of the story with this, don't pop these things because if you get these, because... Um, what's going to happen when you pop these things, there's going to be pus. Okay, essentially what pus is, it's a combination of two things. It's tissue debris, and it is, uh, you're going to see some white blood cells in there. Okay, because pus is typically yellow and white. Okay, it's yellow and white. Okay, so the yellow would be the oils and the damaged skin, and then the white would be some white blood cells that are trying to infiltrate this area and kill the bacteria. If you see red in here, okay, that means blood. Okay, that means you... Two O's in blood. Okay, so that means you, you broke, you, you wound up breaking capillaries around here and you're squeezing blood out. Okay, and the inherent risk with that would be you don't want bacteria to migrate into the bloodstream and, you know, give you sepsis. Okay, so if you get one of these cysts in a certain area, go in, there's a, there's a you know, you can have them cut to relieve the pressure on these, but don't try to handle these on your own. Okay, so, and don't try to handle these sebaceous cysts on your own. Okay, so if you have a big cyst in your armpit or your reproductive region, um, you know, let the, uh, let the doctors take care of this. Okay, and here's, uh, again, really cool images. You see some hair follicles here, see some transverse sections of hair follicles, and these would be the sebaceous glands associated with the hair follicles as well, these oil secreting glands. Really cool. Okay, and then hair in general, um, you know, the, the, the hair, the hair on our scalp, okay, is obviously the thickest area of hair in the body. That's really the only hair that helps keep us warm, okay, which is nice because heat rises, so that does help to shield in some heat, but unfortunately, if you're like me and losing your hair on your head, well, that really stinks. Um, so, so, so that's why you got to wear a hat more often. Um, so scalp hair keeps your, keeps your head warm. The hair on your body, you know, the hair that's on your arms and legs, that's more of a sensory, that, that has more of a sensory function. Okay, so for example, when a bug is crawling on your skin, it's kind of, I'm going to bounce, oops, ah, go right there. Okay, so if we come back to this image right here, all right, now remember, like, let's say you have, I don't know, let's say there's a spider on your skin. Okay, a spider is just too light to apply enough pressure to stimulate those tactile receptors that are in the epidermis. Okay, those, te those tactile, those Merkel discs. All right, but what can happen is as the spider moves around, it's going to bend the hairs. Okay, it's going to bend the hairs. Now, if you look down here, you'll see that there are nerves that are associated with the hairs. Okay, and so what happens when this hair is bent enough, okay, that's how you know, then, the, then what's going to happen is you're going to move that hair, and that's going to be enough to excite these nerves, and then that's how you're going to feel a small object creeping and crawling on your skin. That's how you feel the wind changing directions outside. You know, if the, if the wind is blowing and the hair is bent in a certain direction, that's how you feel that change in air flow. Okay, so that's essentially what the body hair is there for. It's more for a sensory aspect and not for, th for thermal aspects. Okay. Um, you know, there's only a few places of our bodies where we don't have hair, um, you know, such as the palms, the palms of your hands, soles of your feet, your lips, your nipples, and parts of the external genitalia. 
All right. And if we want to just take a look at the basic structure of a hair, you can essentially see that, you know, hair growth begins, you know, very deep within the, you know, within the dermis itself, okay? And the lower part of the hair, you know, that would be the bulb, okay? That would be the bulb of the hair, okay? And down within the bulb of that hair, there's kind of an, there, there's a, a pouch on the underside that's called the the dermal papilla okay now essentially what the dermal papilla is it's an area where you're gonna find capillaries okay blood vessels all right so just like the life cycle of a keratinocyte just like the you know when we talked about the epidermis same thing here okay so basically you've got a you've got groups of cells that are right along a basal layer of the hair, and then they're continuously dividing. And then as, the, as you produce new ones, old ones are pushed up and away. Okay. And then once you get above the bulb, then you have an area of the hair that's basically called the root. Okay. You've got the root of the hair. All right. And then the part of the hair that's protruding out of the skin, essentially the shaft of the hair, that is dead. Okay. That is actually dead hair. Okay, so basically, if we kind of again jump back a little bit, Let me erase all this mess here. Oh, dang it! Uh, Eraser is kind of a pain sometimes. Okay, so if we take a look at this, okay, you know the the hair the hair growth begins down here. Okay, down at the dermal papillae, and then the keratinocytes are pushed up. All right, and then you've got the bulb of the hair, and then you've got the root of the hair um, kind of protruding up into the epidermis, and then you've got the shaft of the hair, and basically that is dead. Those are just dead keratinocytes. Okay, and um, what else do I want to say about that? You know, when it comes to hair coloration, that is genetically determined. Um, you know, ba you know, you know, there's a kind of, you know, basically, hair color is a combination of melanin and other pigments that can provide um, other proteins that provide a, a variety of hair colors. And then when your hair starts to turn gray or white, basically, the melanin is is essentially just replaced by little air bubbles within here and then so basically it looks gray and white that's typically what tissues look like that normally have melanin within them if you strip all the melanin out it's going to look white okay um and that's you know that occurs with albinism uh you know be, people who are albino you know their hair their um skin is that that pasty white because it's, it's a genetic lack of melanin altogether and they have to really be conscientious about the sun all right And then here we can kind of take a look at a picture of a, uh, a, a tissue slide of the, the hair bulb and the hair root. So again, this would be the dermal papilla, this would be the bulb, and then this would be the root. Okay, and then around the, the, the bulb and the, the root of the hair, there is this, there's a, what we call a sheath. Okay, the sheath. And, you know, the sheath is just an area of tissue surrounding the hair, and also the sheath is... You know, important because this may cause an outgrowth and form a sebaceous gland and so on okay um, and also with this you can um, what was I gonna say you know and then basically what happens when you go bald you know the word alopecia okay when you're losing your hair such as myself um, you know essentially what's going on there is it's it's you're stopping the growth of hair and that revolves around hormonal changes that occur within the body um, you know and again that occurs in both male, males and females all right and then the opposite of that would be pursuitism that's basically when you have too much hair all right now when we say people people who have this condition it's you know they're not like some of the people you see at the like some of the guys you see at the state fair that just should not be wearing a tank top because they'll get shot with a tranquilizer gun you know this is um you know these are people that grow really really thick animal-like hair um you know like uh for example the wolf boys of mexico you uh you can see that and you know if you if you google some you know you know, look up pictures of them um, you know you'll see these really really thick you know like hair like you'd see in a dog on their face all over their hands you know basically all areas where hair can grow it looks very very thick all right I mean, and so 
Um, that's about all I really want to talk about with skin, just because there isn't a ton to talk about with that. You know, definitely focus on the histology and the major functions of skin. Um, and, you know, next week we're going to start talking about um, bones and so on. And, you know, there'll be a lot more to talk about with that. So this is the presentation about skin, you know, kind of the important stuff you guys have to remember. You know, again, make sure you read the entire chapter. But these are kind of some of the highlights. And again, if you have any questions, you know, as always, don't hesitate to ask.